Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. Uh, my guest today is Henry Shuck. Henry is the CEO of ZoomInfo, a $17 billion market cap B2B data company. Henry, welcome to World of DAS. Awesome. Thanks, Oren. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Now, I, I really want to dive into data businesses. Um, and you know, ZoomInfo is really one of the only billion dollar data companies that's been founded over the last 30 years, or one of the few. Um, and you started as Discover Org in 2007. Um, and at the time, there were like, there were already a ton of companies selling business contacts. Now, what do you, is, is my, the way I think about Zoom Info success is you, you just decided you're going to focus on quality over some other metric on data. Is that the right way to think of it? Or is there other, or some other like simplistic way of deciding why you were so successful? Yeah, it's not the wrong way to think about it. I think when we found it, so the history is I founded a company uh, with a co-founder called Discover Org in 2007. Yep. Um, and then put $25,000 on my credit card and my co-founder's credit card. We grew, grew the business profitably through 2014. Uh, we brought on a private equity investor then, continued to grow the business. I'm sure we'll talk about that uh, yep. later. But when we launched the company, there were two things that made it sort of unique. Number one, you're absolutely right. Quality was incredibly important and a major differentiator. And so when we went out <clears throat> and we were building our own data sets, and so it was like me and my co-founder and some other like college kids sort of finding information and putting it into a, a, an Excel spreadsheet to be uploaded into a platform for use by our customers. Um, I think a couple of things were unique there. Number one, we were collecting the information essentially in real time. And so the quality was really important. And we decided that we were going to make a big uh, focus on quality because there were a lot of sort of stale lists of data yep. and non-dynamic ways to keep information updated. And we said, look, our data is 95% accurate. We'll continue to stay focused on that. The second is we started in a niche. And so we started with IT. We were collecting information on IT decision makers. And then we were selling that to software and staffing and technology and business services companies who sold to the IT decision maker. That really narrow focus, you know, it turns out IT makes the vast majority, you know, the vast majority of budgetary decisions within a, within a company. They have huge budgets and they're spending on all sorts of solutions. And so the market behind IT decision makers and the people selling to IT decision makers is really large and really fragmented. You have Salesforce consultants and NetSuite yep. consultants, and you have uh, staffing firms that focus on IT and staffing and firms that focus on- And if you're giving like advice to like a new data company, is it, would you say something similar, which is um, focus on high quality, but focus on a small, small amount of data, like a, a niche or a breadth or something? Absolutely, like? 100%. If you can do something that's, that serves, a you know, the key is, What's on the other side of that niche? Who are the who are the who are your customers? Is it is it a big enough niche? Yeah. Um, you know, you don't want to end up building something that's really valuable for 300 companies in a total addressable market. But if you can focus on a niche data element, and then you and and that there's a large enough market behind that who wants to be consumers of the of that data. I would absolutely say that's the way you start a data company. For sure. One of the things I like about Zoom Info is it's very, at least from the outside, it seems like a very simple value proposition. Like SafeGraph, we're a customer of Zoom Info. We, we use it as very simple. Like you give our salespeople uh, uh, high quality contact information and allows us to go reach out to those things. So it's a simple tool. And if it works, like we'll gladly pay for it because it's it's making our sales process better, right? Is it is is, yep. is in, in some ways the sometimes the problem with data is it isn't so simple, but you're in some ways very lucky that you can make it very simple. Is that, is that right, or do you think about it in a different way? 
Yeah, totally. Look, uh, it is very simple. Our sales cycles are sub 30 days in a lot of, or in a lot of companies, we sell same day, same day deals. And so we get a VP of sales or a CEO on the platform. They see it, they instantly know the value that they're going to be able to get with the data and with the platform. And, you know, they're signing $30,000 checks same day to yeah, become customers awesome. of Zoom Info. Yeah. Is the value proposition is so obvious and clear. I think what happens um, is as you mature as a data company, or, or at least as we've matured, what we've, what we've been focused on is really building a platform and an application layer on top of that data. And so to be able to say, look, here's there are a number of different ways our customers use the data and a number of different tools and software solutions that they either use the data inside of or that they would that they would like to have an integration into yep. and so when we look at that universe we go okay like let's build the application layer for our customers to be able to take advantage of that data in their systems of record in their systems of engagement and then where there are systems of engagement or, or where there are opportunities within the application layer for us to own, we should own that application layer because the data is a meaningful differentiator when it's plugged into that application layer. And how, so that's how, how we mature. Like, you know, there's like, in some ways, there's these da data businesses that just sell data, which is kind of like where you started, right? Yep. And then there's these application businesses. Sometimes application businesses have their own proprietary data, which makes the application better. How do you think about this kind of continuum of like data versus application and where you sit on those continuums? Because you you could end up, you know, I, I guess you you could you could if you think of like Salesforce, a lot of your customers use Salesforce. Um, Salesforce is an application, but you could have an application that also has things that could potentially compete with Salesforce. Or it's, So where do you think about that continuum? Yeah. So first, I think it's very hard to start as an application company and become a data company. Yeah. I think that- Almost no starting, one's ever done that. Yeah. Almost no one's ever done that. I don't know. It has I don't think anybody- I'm not sure anybody has done that. Probably. Um, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Which is like, uh, so I do think- um, you can start as a data company and grow into becoming, uh, grow, grow into picking and choosing the application layer, yep. especially if you can do that through MA. Like today, for example, we announced an acquisition of a website chat company called Incent. Website chat's been around for a while, uh, yep. lots of sales teams use it, but we really fundamentally believe that when our data asset gets plugged into chat, it becomes significantly more powerful. And when we have an audience of sales development reps and account executives who are already on the other end of chat inside of Zoom Info, if we're able to give them data and insights around the chat that they're having, it makes them much more powerful. How do you, it makes like, the when you think about that, engaging. like that's a very interesting strategic thing that you bought this website chat company because you could have also done an opposite thing where you, you could have made a BD deal with Drift and Intercom and all these different, and they could have each paid you $5 million to do it, to it, to, and, and they could, and you could have powered those things. So how did you make a decision of, instead of like powering these other applications to, to own that, these applications? Look, historically, I don't love BD deals. Um, they're not my favorite types of deals to do. I do believe the data is a meaningful piece of IP that we have. And yep. we're very careful with sharing that IP from a BD perspective. Now, if it's in a totally tangential space or totally sort of left field space that we're never going to really get into, then I have much less of an issue with BD deals. But if it sits around the go to market space, you know, look, I believe there's going to be a decent amount of uh, of consolidation in the go-to-market B2B sales and marketing software landscape. And so if it's something that we have ambitions to be a part of uh, or to build or to buy in the space, I try to not like go do a BD deal only to like come back a year later and pull it out because we have ambitions to be in that space. And so I'm pretty careful about it. And how does it like, because like when you think of Zoom Info, Zoom Info is the clear dominant leader for business contacts. Um, it's, it's um, you know, it, 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 I don't know what percentage market share, but very, very high percentage market share. It's the one that everyone goes to. It's kind of the clear leader. Whereas like if you become a solution um, 
you know, uh, unlikely you'll have one that has 50% market share. Maybe you get one that mm-hmm. has like, a, but sometimes the leader is 30% and then the second place mm-hmm. is 20 and the third place is 10. And, um, and, and, and unlikely, sometimes you could even have the leader. So whereas the, the nice thing about these data businesses is you can actually like have a winner take most type of market. How do you think about like moving into that application stack? Um, and then of course you're creating like enemies of these other competitors um, as well. So how do you, how do you think, like, how do you think those things throw? Look, I think first we're a pretty good competitor. We're not like uh, the type of competitor that creates a bunch of FUD and talks really badly about our competition. I, I like to believe we're a competitor that makes everybody else a little bit better in the spaces yep. that we operate in. Um, so, so I think that's the first thing. I don't think anybody we can comp- compete with in the application layer or the data layer will tell you like, those guys are scumbags, you know, yeah. like they just yeah. don't say that yeah, about yeah, us. We're yeah. good. We're good people. We're a good competitor. In fact, I had somebody recently tell me he made a move. He's been in the industry for 20 years. And he told me like, I'm so, I have a new sense of pride about the industry I play in because of your team's success and your company's success, because I often feel surrounded by a number of people who just are not people that others aspire to be. And I've got Zoom info in the marketplace where I'm like really proud of telling my family, like, yeah, this is the industry I play in. Um, So you look, so that's one thing. I think the other piece is, um, uh, I think the other piece is, um, when, when, uh, we don't have to win in every space, right? I don't have to be the number one, every go to market software, uh, uh, piece. And I appreciate competition in those uh, spaces too. And people are innovating and we're learning from one another. And so I don't have to be the best. I don't have to be the biggest chat software, uh, in the world, I can be a really great provider of chat software and a consolidated all-in-one end-to-end package and go out to market with that solution and win in a lot of spaces without having you know, the most market share. Yeah. And I think as long as I believe that the application layer that we're investing in is going to be there for the long term and that the data is going to make a meaningful difference within that platform and that our sellers can sell it, because on the business side, like we need solutions that our sellers can sell. And so if our sellers can sell it, I, I feel really good about getting into that space, whether I'm you know, ultimately the, the number one champion with the biggest market share or not, you know, I think you know, we, wanna be, we wanna be in those spaces. And over time, I think over time, what you see like Salesforce acquires Pardot, Pardot is like what the number four or five marketing automation yeah. player when they make the acquisition. And now it's easily like one or two. And it's taken, it's taken time. Oh, really? it's taken I had no idea. I, I don't know anyone that uses it. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of people who use it. Okay. Or yeah, CEDA, so I've never CPQ heard is another one, you know, like okay. C, the CPQ tools that they bought. So it's an interesting, Salesforce is an interesting one to look at in that respect. Yeah. Okay. Now, now the, the, I think there's a lot of different ways to create a data business. When you guys started, you kind of had like these humans, as you mentioned, like college kids kind of doing yep. QA and kind of assembling the data together originally in Excel spreadsheet. One of your old competitors, like at around almost exactly at the same time, Jigsaw, they kind of took this different approach by creating this like co-op of salespeople yep. where they're bringing that data together. And you know, both are actually really good strategies for acquiring totally. data. Like, how do you think of like one versus the other? And I now you, I know you do both, but how do you think of one versus the other and how to get started? Yeah, so I believe that co-ops or contributory networks are super valuable to data businesses. Anytime you can get customers or freemium users to provide data in exchange for more services or limited free access to your platform, if you can create a whole bunch of contributors in that way, you get a lot of raw data that you can do something with. Yep. The issue with that raw data is that it's raw data. Like if I went to any of our customers' CRM systems, I'm going to find 50% bad data in those systems. Yep. That doesn't do me any good from an end product perspective, but it does from a raw data and a signals perspective. And so what I need to do is be able to bring all that data to a central place and then build machine learning underneath it to be able to predict what's accurate and what's not. 
inside of that data and then only publish what's actually accurate. But in order for those machine learning systems to work, they need to know which 50% inside of that CRM data or inside of that freemium customer's data is accurate and is not accurate. And so then you layer humans in to say, this is accurate, this is not accurate, this is accurate, this is not accurate. And over time, the system becomes smarter at being able to predict what's accurate and not, and then publish just what's accurate. Got it, yeah, that makes that makes sense. Like we have, at SafeGraph, we we have data about like for something simple, like store hours of the McDonald's on 555 Main Street or something. Yep. And, um, and, and even if it was accurate before, maybe it was open at 7 a.m. before, it may not still be accurate. Now it might be open at 6.30 a.m. And so yep. we need to score and we're bringing this data from, let's say, hundreds of different sources, um, all of, and that data may conflict. And same thing with your case, like this, it might say the CIO of this company is two different people or something like that, because yep, one right. used to be the CIO and a different one is now, it may conflict. And then, um, and then we'll we'll have like a human grade it. Of course, they can't grade all of our data. I'm sure same thing with you because you have billions yep. and billions of data elements. Is there some sort of like, think, okay, we're going to grade a small percentage, and then and then every week that comes yes. back into the algorithms, and hopefully we're getting like slightly better at predicting all these things. Yep, that's exactly right. So every week we will look at certain pieces of data, certain different sources of that data, and then we're able to. Um, then predict that data in the future better. So we may be able to say now, we've looked at thousands of different data sources and we say, look, this one data source is always incredibly accurate. It's 95% accurate. So don't have a human look at it anymore. Um, and then that just finds its way in directly into the pipe. And so that's what you're looking, looking to do with those human researchers. Are there other like contributory data, um, uh, contributory networks or data co-ops uh, that you've studied that you're like, oh, like are, they might be in different industries, whether it be Verisk or Visa or other types of companies. And, and, and then somehow you've taken some of those learnings back into Zoom Info. Yeah, totally. So first, I think uh, I think CoStar has done a pretty great job of yep. this. CoStar is in the commercial real estate space. They have a great contributory network with their uh, brokerage teams. I think, um, and just you know, for 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 everyone else, like CoStar, what they they have all these brokers that like might contribute rent per square foot at some Manhattan office space or something. That's right. And um, and that's really really hard data to get. It's maybe not online, or you you can't necessarily crawl that data. And they're getting all these different people entering it. And maybe no one person has the right answer. But if you get enough coming in, they can they can at least have a sense of the average is probably close to correct, right? The, the, the wisdom of the crowd yep. is enough point. Yeah, totally. And so they have all these brokers, they share information, they collect that information, and then they're able to predict the right, uh, the right lease square footage or the right tenants in the building or the right cost per square foot. That's exactly right. CoStar does a nice job with that. Coupa, um, which that's an interesting one, because I was thinking when we we're talking about this the one, software company, the software company, oh, right? I had no idea. Okay. And I don't, I can't remember if Coupa started with data or it started with the application. Um, but essentially what Coupa does is it brings together a bunch of people's purchasing decisions. And so there's a contributory network where every purchase you're making um, is feeding a contributory network. And then they're able to provide you analytics on spend. Are you spending more or less than a company of your similar size on this, on these different uh, types of services or companies? And so like, it's like, class, we'll say like um, for your SaaS tools, do you spend more or less and exactly. they benchmark you and stuff? Oh, that's cool. Exactly. That's super yeah, cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And a great contributory network and people view it as a really strong, uh, they, they view the contributory network as an incredibly valuable piece of the Koopa story. Hmm. Um, so I think that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, we said CoStar. Uh, who else has really great contributory? I mean, we all use a, uh, you know, we probably all use stuff for salary benchmarking in our companies, yep. right? Where we totally. contribute that. And that, that's always a, a very useful service that, that can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Glassdoor is a yeah. contributory network. So, totally. Right. In some yeah. ways, every big B2C company, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, right? Yep. They're all, they're all data co-ops because yeah, like, totally. you know, that's how they, that's how they work essentially. Right. Um, yep. Okay, that that's that, that that that's super interesting. And how do you get like in these contributory data networks? How do you it, how do you get people over the hump? Because sometimes people, uh, companies are a bit hesitant to share that first party data. They want to know how it's going to be used, and um, and 
is it is it like well okay zoom info has a great brand so it's a little bit easier but when you're just starting how do you get people over the hump to be willing to share that type of data yeah, look, I think first you start with data that feels like exhaust data, data that's not really important to your customer or is auto is auto collected off of their system. So, for example, um, one of the pieces of data that we collect from our contributory network and really where we started with the contributory network is bounced emails and conf yep. confirmatory emails from marketing automation systems. Yeah. Nobody cares about bounced or confirmation emails from their systems. And so we told our customers, when you integrate your marketing automation systems, one of the things we want you to share with us is the bounced and delivery confirmation systems. The whole community gets better oh, as yeah, a that's result so awesome. of you sharing yeah. that. And they're totally willing to do that share. You gain trust that way. And then you can move on to, you can sort of move on to more, uh, you know, call it more sensitive information, um, but, but information that they may be more guarded about because they trust the brand, they trust how you were a steward of their data before, and they see the network getting better as a result of their contribution to it. But ultimately you give them a choice. You know, not everybody has to be a contributor to your network in order for the network to be really valuable. And so you, you build in controls, you build in a privacy center that gives them the ability to opt in and opt out of sharing. Um, and you give a lot of transparency into the information that you're collecting in a contributory way and, and you give them total control over it. One, one, one idea, one, or one thing will be really useful, this is my free idea to you, um, is uh, what I would find useful sometimes when you're reaching out to a contact, I think certain people like are very known to respond really, really quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and yep. certain people might take like five days to respond and that could potentially inform your drip of how quickly yep. you want to, and that could be a very easy, okay, this, this, this email usually responds within 24 hours. This email usually responds within seven days or, you know, or something like that. Yeah. Um, you need a big network to be able to get that type of right. data yeah. at scale. Yeah. Um, well, you, and you guys have that now, right? You're, we you're have one a pretty of the few companies network. that yeah. may actually know that. Um, one of my, my friends used to work at a B2B appointment setting company. And to this point, he had like a list they had, they had marked in their systems, a list of people who would always take an appointment. Okay. And so if it was like Friday afternoon and you were trying to hit your quota and you were struggling with the regular list, you would just go to the list of people you knew who'd always take an appointment with one of your customers and you'd fire, you, you know, you'd call them and they'd set an appointment. Yeah. So yeah having a yeah. list of people, you know, respond <laughs> is super valuable. Interesting. Um, now, I, okay, back to Jigsaw. So I, I remember this is like 11 years ago now when Jigsaw got bought by Salesforce. This is 2010. And at the time I was thinking, okay, Salesforce is just going to own business contact data because they already had all the contacts, as you mentioned, in salesforce.com. And, yep. and they could just kind of keep the Jigsaw playbook and all of a sudden millions of salespeople would have access to it. But in retrospect, like they didn't win. Like what, what happened in retrospect? And then they take us back also 11 years ago. Were you like super worried at the time? <laughs> and, um, or were you like, did you understand, okay, your playbook's going to be different and you're still going to run it out? Yeah, look, for, for whatever reason, um, I wasn't particularly worried when Salesforce made the acquisition of Jigsaw. Jigsaw was in our space but it didn't really like, it wasn't an obvious competitor. People were using us for different use cases than they were using Jigsaw for, or yep. they were Jigsaw customers and they were Discover Org customers. And so I remember seeing, and by the way, I was young. So like, I probably didn't have the, I was probably a little bit naive to, you know, luckily naive to really understand sort of what you understood, Oren, when that acquisition happened, which was like, oh, you know, Salesforce is going to own the entire data space. Like, why would anybody buy data from yeah, anybody else? I mean, they, else? they even had the the name data.com, right? They oh, bought that data. domain name. Such a great domain name yeah. too, like the best. Um, and I was like, okay, that's, you know, you, I just didn't appreciate it for what it was. Um, <laughs> and so I just kept running the play and people were still buying from us and they still liked our data and they would bring up Jigsaw, but the quality in Jigsaw was so bad that it was really easy to combat. You would just tell people like, yeah, you know, Jigsaw, the data is not very good. It's super out of date. Like it's just not a very good system um, of data. And it actually like wasn't because yeah. there wasn't a lot of investment behind making sure the data inside Jigsaw was accurate. 
And so people started having more and more bad experiences with the data there and it never really took off. And I think that was a big reason why Salesforce ultimately sunsetted it last year was that the, the, the brand harm from a platform that was sort of so filled with bad data uh, was just not worth ha- being in the space. Interesting. Okay. Now, another kind of data growth that we mentioned is, is LinkedIn in a way, right? Um, and they don't seem to want to be a data company. Like they're not wanting uh-huh. to like export their data, but and, and so my, in my vantage point, sometimes like LinkedIn is like a gateway drug to Zoom info. Like you start in LinkedIn and you sort of understand they're like, well, I need, I need like all the data. I go, <laughs> then I go to Zoom info. Like how, do, how do you see those synergies? And it's kind of like f- frenemy type of thing as well. How, how do you see that evolving over time? Yeah, look, I think obviously LinkedIn is a great data asset for sure. It's, you know, from a contributory network perspective, they've absolutely figured out how to get people to contribute the information about their jobs and what they're working on and whether they're open to work or not. You know, so it's an incredible contributory network. Uh, and, and look, I believe that LinkedIn is a channel for sales and marketers and obviously recruiters to engage with potential candidates, potential prospects, potential customers. Um, but I believe it to be one channel. Like companies don't go to market entirely on LinkedIn. And I don't think LinkedIn advocates that companies go to market entirely on LinkedIn. Uh, It does make sense to have it as a balanced, uh, in a balanced approach to how you generate interest and top of the funnel demand for your products and services. LinkedIn should be a place where you do ad spend, where you uh, connect with uh, prospects and and yeah. customers either through in-mail or uh, really targeted ads or connecting with them. Um, what I don't think, uh, what I don't think is that that will that will in any universe be the only place you go to market. And so it keeps open all of these other marketing automation, sales automation, direct direct marketing, direct mail, direct phone calls to potential buyers programmatic ads, Twitter ads, yep. the ability to build B2B audiences in Facebook. And so there are all of these other very important channels to go to market. And LinkedIn is one of them. And then there are a whole bunch of other ones that we're focused on powering. It's and interesting because so these see- companies like LinkedIn, like their superpower is both a, a feature and a bug, right? The, the superpower is you can interact with customers right there on their platform. But because of that, they never want you to, they never want to encourage you to not be on their platform, right? Yep. Because that might that might ruin. And of course, like as you mentioned, LinkedIn is a great channel, but no one uses it as their only channel. It's it's one of it could be one of forty different channels you use to 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 acquire customers or find new customers. Yeah, I also think the other thing there is, um, <clears throat> I think the other piece about LinkedIn is it is at its heart a professional social network. You know, it's not advertised as a sales or a marketing platform. It's a professional yep. social network. And the idea that LinkedIn would take the data that exists in their platform and then pump it into, you know, every company's CRM and marketing automation system would just cripple the network. Yes. And so there is like a line that they really can't cross. And they've been very careful to maintain their users' privacy and users' trust to make sure they don't trip that wire. Um so, so I think you'll always see them as a company that's married to their platform and is not like letting their data filter its way through every company's CRM or marketing automation systems. Now, I, I, let's dive into data business because I think like me, you're super interested in looking at other data companies um, in other industries. Zoom Info is, is, is definitely been a super successful pure play data business that's been built in the last 20 years. There hasn't been a ton of others um, that maybe you'll disagree with me on that. Um, in, in the, 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 and the question is like, is that going to change? Are we going to see like an acceleration of more data businesses in the future? Uh, because certainly it, uh, people are becoming much more data oriented. It's a lot easier for people to consume data than it was in the past. There are a lot more tools, there's Snowflake, et cetera. Yeah, how, how do you think that's going to evolve? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think if you look at data businesses that have gotten to, you know, let's just call it a billion dollars in uh, value yeah. over the last 20 years. And you compare that to software businesses. 
yes. uh, that have gotten to a billion dollars in value. It's like a tiny speck. It's on like one percent, yeah. you know, or something. Yeah, yeah, maybe less yeah, than one percent. Yeah. yeah, you know, for yeah. every almost certainly less, right? For every hundred companies that are, for every hundred software companies that become a billion dollars in valuation, how many data companies are behind? Yeah, less them? than one. Yeah, less than one. Yep. Um, I you know, honestly, or I don't know. Um, I don't see a proliferation of them coming to market. Um, I don't see very many new data companies that um, that are anything but niche coming to market and gaining much scale. So, um, but your point is a good one. There are so many more ways to use data in all of your different sales processes, marketing processes, finance operations, revenue operations, understanding your customer better. And there are more technologies that let you take advantage of that. There's so many things that we do today with Snowflake and with solar and elastic yeah. that three years ago, if you, four years ago, if you told us, Hey, just do this, we'd be like, I don't, I don't, yeah, even, I'm gonna I don't find know these amazing engineers to help me do that right now. Yeah. Now, uh, a good engineer plus Snowflake could do what a great engineer could do five years ago. Totally. And so I do think there will be much more of an appetite for all sorts of different types of data. Um, the question is how many people are going to step up to the plate to provide that? I, you know, I do think you know, Zoom Info's IPO really did open a lot of people's eyes to the fact that you can build a scalable data business, um, especially if you wrap software around it and it has a meaning, it can have a meaningful exit in the public markets. And so I think there are a lot more eyes uh, and a lot more dollars focused on these types of businesses. You just saw similar web go public, I think yep. uh, two weeks ago, it had a good uh, public outing. Um, and I think you'll see more companies relative to where we are today uh, come out as data companies, but I don't think it's gonna catch in the next decade, I doubt it catches the same steam as software has. One of the big transitions in software starting, let's say, a little bit more than 10 years ago was the cloud, right? And so it just became a lot easier for companies to buy software. You didn't have to have the integration. You didn't have to bring in like Accenture to the integrated mm -hmm. into your stack and everything. You could start at, you know, a $30,000 purchase or something, not a $3 million purchase. And you started to see this massive, um, the, the, the number of software vendors that the average company like Best Buy or something like that was, uh, went up like 10x in 10 years. So the, 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 the dollar per software company went down. So maybe the total dollars only went up, let's say three or four X or something. But the, you could see a similar revolution happening with data just because so, it's companies are just becoming much more data oriented. It's much easier yep. for them to bring in data today than it was before. But you know, maybe, maybe as you said, not exactly on that same speed. Uh, it is interesting you said this, like companies are getting... Uh, inspired by Zoom Info, SafeGraph, when we raised our Series B, like the first slide was like, hey, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, data companies, it, okay, maybe it wasn't a good idea to invest in data companies in the past, but look at Zoom Info, like it's an incredible <laughs> success story. Uh, and so, we, you know, we compared ourselves saying, okay, we're, we're like Zoom Info, but data for physical places. And I'm sure all these other companies are trying to do something similar um, today. Now, when you're building this data asset, like, how do you think, like, as you mentioned before, you can optimize for breadth, you can optimize for depth, you can optimize for accuracy. Like, how do you, how do you think, and as the company changes stage, how do you think which one is more important? How do you evolve that over time? How do you look for like these adjacencies to move into and in data, et cetera? Yeah. Uh, so first, um, let me comment one second on the, on the growth of uh, data. I, yeah. I do think one of the limiters here is, there aren't a lot of people who understand data and really understand how to how to work with data and build you know build um, operations around data. So I do think that's increasing. You're seeing more and more people take a data first approach in all of their operations. But we just do the number really of need... data scientists. The word exactly. the title data scientist has gone up like 10x in the last 10 years or something, right? Yeah. Or or even you you know you kind of need a lot more. You just need a lot more practitioners around data operations, revenue operations, sales operations, yeah. marketing operations, folks who really have a data 
uh, focused lens on their businesses to really come up. Um, you know, you need universities teaching this. You need people really understanding it and then coming into the into the marketplace to deliver it to their to their companies. So I do think that's more evolutionary than it is exponential. Um, so I, I still think there's time. The yeah. uh, on on how do you focus on which data piece is most important, or is it the application layer? Um, I think for us, uh, we wanted to have a really horizontal solution. We wanted to be able to sell our solution to anybody, uh, for, to any company that sells to another company. And you know, we have HVAC maintenance companies. We have a pecan exporter in Georgia who's a customer, and then yeah. we have Fortune 100 companies who are customers as well. Um, and so, you know, we wanted a horizontal solution that we could sell to any to anybody. And so, we were really focused on making sure we get that breadth of uh, contact and company information, and then picked our spots where we'd have breadth. And so, IT, which is this huge fragmented yeah. market or engineering, you want to be able to go deep there. You want technographics, and you want projects and initiatives that are happening in IT, and you want to make sure you go really deep on the CIO and the CTO, and have IT spending models. Um, that's a really important one. You know, people who buy pecans in Georgia. There just isn't enough. There just yeah. isn't enough yeah, yeah. of a tan there to yeah. go really deep, and so they benefit from having the horizontal solution, um, the horizontal solution. But if they want to augment that, you know, they either are creating their own data assets that they're uh, that they're appending against ours, or you know, in in insurance. Well, there are and a every bunch company, of every company yep. doesn't even with Zoom in, even with Zoom Info is great. Every company is still taking maybe the zoom info data and then and then doing some sort of filter on it and trying to figure out okay who who actually are their best customers because yep. you, no one knows your own customers better than yourself right so you, zoom info gives you this kind of like breath and then you, then you then you got to narrow it down in some sort of oh. way or add to it or add add your messaging to it etc yep and i think that uh you know we would love to get to a place where uh, and we've built this with Salesforce, but we'd love to be at a place where we can bring in your first party data, whatever it is, wherever it exists, and let you marry it against the Zoom Info data asset to build a bunch of segments and a bunch of different filters. Yeah. Um, I think that's incredibly valuable. And to the same point that, you know, Zoom Info gets you started, but you're going to want to bring in your own data your own, your own uh, first party data, your opportunity data, your CRM data, your marketing automation data to really be able to build segments that make sense. Now, the way I see the data businesses, there's kind of like four categories of data. There's data about people, places, organizations, and products. And Zoom Info is kind of, I would say, in the some somewhat of a, a mix of people and, and organizations kind of data, mostly people like who are within organizations. And people data is, in some ways is the most privacy sensitive. Um, in, in, even though Zoom Info is business context, I'm sure you've had to deal with a lot of different privacy things that have happened, and especially that has changed over the last 15 years. Like, how do you see that evolving um, in this kind of people data world? Yeah. So, look, number one, uh, data privacy is a big, uh, big focus of ours as a company, um, literally from our board of directors to individual data privacy practitioners that we have in our company, we're focused on data privacy and making sure that we're far ahead um, of any regulation and, and any competitor or, and anything in the industry. We really are leading the way from a data privacy perspective. For us, um, that starts with the type of information we collect and we collect business contact information. Yeah, which is the the definitely one of the easier ones to deal with on that front. You're not totally. collecting like medical data or something, right? A hundred percent. I often give the example of like you were walking down the street and you dropped your business card on the floor and you realize 10 minutes later that you had dropped your business card. You're not going to sprint back to the place that you right. dropped your business card to yeah. pick it up out of fear that your privacy was going to be violated as a result yep. of that. In fact, often you're that, passing them out like candy to try to get more exactly. customers and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so the information is not particularly sensitive. In fact, if you look at a lot of the privacy legislation across the world, they have specific carve outs for business contact information not being sensitive. If you look yep. at Canada's PEPITA, 
uh, privacy law specifically carves out business contact information as non-sensitive information when used for B2B sales and marketing efforts. The California CCPA has a B2B exemption. The GDPR has a legitimate interest for direct marketing. Draft legislation at the federal level and throughout different states have business have carve outs for business contact information. The uh, do not call list in the United States does not apply to business and to business phone calls. Yep. And so there is a fundamental respect for business contact information and business to business sales and marketing motions around that information um, that's been recognized by regulation regulators and carved out. Uh, of a lot of their legislation. That being said, we go, uh, you know, if we collect your information, we give you proactive notice of that. Uh, so we're very transparent. If your information is in Zoom info, uh, you've received an email from us at some point that says, hey, we've collected your information. This is the type of information we've oh, collected. That's cool. And then These you can even get people to update it, it, which would be nice as well. Exactly. Right? Yeah. We're seeing more and more of that even. So more yeah. and more companies are coming to us and saying, hey, I want to update my company information. I want to update my information on the platform. I had a friend from law school who emailed me, said he just changed jobs and he needs to update his Zoom info profile. <laughs> and how does he do that? Uh, so, so you give people control over their information. There's a publicly available privacy center on our website. You can go see the information we've collected on, on you. If we have any, you can update it. You can remove it. You can add to it. Um, so you're, we're incredibly transparent. We give data subjects control over their, their information. Um, and ultimately, I think that's what all of the legislation around privacy is focused on. Now, one of the, when, I, when I try to study Zoom Info, one of the things that really stood out to me is, is how effectively you've used acquisitions and bought different companies, including the Discover Word acquisition of Zoom Info. Um, and do you think it's easier and, and maybe even easier to be accretive for a data company to acquire another data company rather than a software company to acquire a software company? Yeah, so I think if you've built a great platform, that it is easier because ultimately it becomes a function of integrating data yep. across your, you know, in into your existing platform. You don't have to worry about whole UI change and all these other things. Yeah, exactly. There might be some little UI tweaks you do to be able to better display the new data asset. But if you have a core platform, bringing the data into that platform is a lot easier than, you know, merging two disparate software solutions into one. Um, that's a bigger challenge, uh, but just data. I think that's, you know, the ranking acquisition was kind of purely data. The iProfile acquisition we did was purely data. The EverString acquisition we did uh, was mainly data. The ClickAG acquisition was mainly data or purely data. And so when you're making- And even those, Zoom Info, before you acquired them, I think they acquired data nice, right? And so, which is kind yep. of in that data world, yep. Zoom Info was super interesting just because not only did we get an incredible data asset, but we also got an incredible engineering team yep. um, that was building on next generation technologies and moved fast and innovated quickly. We got a, We have an incredible CTO as part of the organization. Um, that we inherited. And so we were really able to accelerate the pace of innovation as a result of that uh, acquisition. And we were able to integrate the data and the platforms in seven months, um, which Amazing. is you know pretty yeah. unheard of. And so, uh, so yeah, I do believe that when it's just data, but you start with a really great platform that you have an opportunity to make that acquisition much easier. Zoom Info also is a cool company because in some ways it's like a very entrepreneurial company it, it, it's kind of like a venture studio right if you remember back in the day like they 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 took a employee at their company Russ Glass and they spun out Bizzo yep. and they created a whole new company out of it which is <laughs> kind of cool and usually unheard of but it, they just had this kind of like entrepreneurial flavor that most other companies didn't have yeah or you might be one of like five people in the world who uh, appreciate the spin out of Bizzo in uh, from Zoom info um but super interesting, right? Bizzo it was like an early competitor in the ABM space. And yeah. so it helped people do B2B, uh, to, to do ads against the B2B audience um, that you see today being provided by, you know, demand base or Sixth Sense or Terminus or uh, metadata are out there providing that, that capability. It was ultimately bought by LinkedIn. Yep. Um, and then LinkedIn just shut it down kind of like six months later. I remember, um, yeah. 
<laughs> and my sense is it's because LinkedIn wants to be the only place that you can place ads against a B2B audience. Um, and so they don't really need another competitor out there letting you do ads in the B2B space. Um, but yes, the way well, I remember that very clear because uh, Bizzo was my customer at the time when I was running LiveRamp. And so, and then we lost them when, when LinkedIn shut it down. So. <laughs> yep. That makes sense. Now, um, w- one of the things you guys have done effectively, I think, and you could, you could, uh, I really want to get your thoughts on this. So you, you, when you've done these acquisitions, you've done them generally with debt, right? Not with equity. Um, and I, I would love your thoughts about like when to use debt, when not to use debt, how to think of how to, uh, when can you use debt when you're doing these acquisitions, uh, et cetera. Yeah. So, you know, we always ran a pretty profitable business. And so uh, if you're running a profitable business, you have an opportunity to use debt when you're making acquisitions um, and you don't have to use equity and dilute. And were the most of, of the their... businesses you acquired also profitable? Most. Yeah. Great. Okay. Point. So that also makes business... it easier as well. Totally. So if you're, you know, two things, one, most of the businesses we were acquiring were also profitable. They were also being run less efficiently than we were running uh, discover org. Yeah. Um, so you had so, a thesis about how to get them more efficient. Okay. Exactly. And so we could come in and we, you know, when we raised the debt, we said, look, uh, this is us today. This is them today. Here's how we're going to bridge that gap. And within 12 months, we're going to significantly increase margins and continue to grow sales at the combined businesses. Um, and so the debt markets can get behind that type of acquisition. They've seen it a lot. Private equity firms do this all the time. And so they have a strong conviction. If they can have a strong conviction in the motion and they feel good about management's ability to execute against that motion, you can raise debt to make those acquisitions. And so every time we had the opportunity to make an acquisition with debt, we would make that acquisition with debt as opposed to equity because it dilutes less, right? I mean, I don't know if everybody understands the mechanics, but like if I take $100 of debt at a 10% interest rate um, in three years, you know, I've paid $30, but if I take $100 of equity and the business triples in size, yep. now I'm paying $300 to that yep. equity holder. Um, and so it makes a meaningful difference in a growing business. Yep. Yep. Okay. That makes, and when, and, and, and what advice would you give for companies that are thinking about other data companies are thinking about acquisitions? Is it like, okay, should you start with a tiny one first and get the muscle going or how, you know, how, how do you think, how, how should yes. companies think those through? Totally. Start with a tiny one first. Uh, get your muscle. We did a very small acquisition of a company called iProfile in 2015. Um, it was a small acquisition. There weren't very many employees. And, and give was, us a sense, how big was Zoom Info in like a revenue standpoint in 2015? Or... So this was Discover Org, but yeah, it was Discover Org, yeah. um, 35 million, 30 to 40 okay, million. So that was, you're already are. pretty sizable before you even make your first acquisition. Yeah. We're pretty sizable by the time we made that first acquisition. Yeah. Okay. Million. Okay. Interesting. I- interesting. And, and, and Go ahead. Yeah. We just, you know, look, we, we probably made every mistake you could possibly make in that acquisition, but you at least got in a room where you did diligence and you asked a bunch of questions and you thought about integrating a customer base and you had communications that went out to that customer base and you combined custom overlap customers. And so you had a framework to then go do a much bigger acquisition. And so after I profile, we did Rain King in the summer of 2017, which was, we paid $280 million for, it was about a 250 person business with a $40 million of ARR. Um, and that was a big acquisition for us. Uh, yeah. They were across the country. There were lots of employees that need to be integrated. We needed to do a bunch of customer overlap. We were sunsetting a platform, but we had done, we had gone through that before. And so at least you knew like, hey, here are the things we need to do. Yeah, interesting. Okay, the, now what is the, there are, you know, w- one of the things you've done is some of the acquisitions you made have been in essentially direct competitors. Um, and, uh, and one of the cool things that's happened is like end up lifting all your boat, everyone's boats, right? Everyone, everyone benefited the shareholders of those companies, the employees of those companies, et cetera. But I, I imagine it's a little tricky to even breach these m a discussions with rivals in the first place. Like, how do you start those out? 
Yeah. So you benefit tremendously if the other company is owned by private equity. Okay. Cause they um, have to do something. Yeah. They have to do something. They have a threshold for a return. They want to make like three to five X their money in three to five years. They're rational thinkers on the other end. And you're able to have rational conversations where, you know, dollars make up the difference, you know, like, uh, they're looking for their return. And if you could hit their return threshold, they're happy to sell the business. Yep. Um, and so we we, all, we always started engagement at the private equity level, um, at the private equity shareholder, the, the partner level. Yep. Um, and then if we could get agreement there, we went into the, the business itself. Um, now, both of, you know, both Zoom Info and Ranking, when we acquired them, they were no longer founder led either. They were, they had brought in a professional CEO. Um, and so the professional CEO's job was to make sure that the private equity firm saw a big return. Yeah. Um, and so they were happy to be a part of the motion too. I've also in, uh, I've also like with ranking, we tried to buy ranking from the founder years before we acquired ranking. And it just like, you know, founders are emotional and totally it's their baby and they're paranoid and it's much 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 more difficult to get them to uh engage and so um if you have an opportunity to build a relationship with a founder uh at one of your competitors you know i would do it go meet them in person uh as soon as rain king was sold and they brought in a new ceo i called them and said hey i'm gonna be in dc and i just like made a trip to dc yeah can we meet up for lunch? And we met up for lunch and we had a, we had a relationship before we dove into the M and a conversations, which made things easier, but ultimately you want rational thinkers on the other end of the, of the line. And you get that with investors. Okay. Interesting. Now, a couple of personal questions before we, before we go. Now I, I heard that you, you film these like mini shows when you interview your daughter um <laughs> and a, a grace right and, um, yeah. and you've been doing it since she was like one years old for like how do you how do these work and how'd you get the idea yeah i can't remember how i got that idea i think i like did it once and i was like wouldn't it be cool if i do this a lot so it's basically grace and i get in front of my daughter's five we get in front of a computer we start recording on QuickTime, and it's basically a combination of me asking her questions about herself or her day and then we sing a song that go that where I just say grace data grace over and over and over again uh -huh. I bounce her kind of on my knee and so now I have five nearly five years four and a half years of footage of us doing these grace data grace videos over time and I can go back and I can watch it when she's one and I can watch it when she's three and five it's awesome and so the other thing I do is I send her emails. She has an email account that uh -huh. I started for her when she was born. And so every once in a while, I'll hop in there and shoot her an email to tell her, uh, you know, I love her. Or oh, what so she, she did can today. like read these really later fun. or something? Yeah. So when she's 18, I'll give her oh, access oh to the email. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, what a great, yeah. oh man, I'm going to copy that so idea. That's steal those idea. ideas. Oh, for wow. Sure. This is really good. Wow. This is like way better than the data company stuff. Uh, <laughs> Okay, this is the last question we ask all of our guests. Like, if you if you had to go back in time, and what would you have told yourself in you know high school, college that um, you know would have really benefited the 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 future Henry Shuck? So it's not uh, so the what I'm going to say would not have changed my direction. Yeah, um, it would have made me a lot more comfortable along the way, but I would have told myself, "You are good enough. You are good enough." Like, it's, it's okay you didn't go to Harvard. It's okay uh -huh. you didn't go to Stanford. It's okay that you haven't done it before. You are smart enough. You're going to work hard enough. You are good enough to be great. Because I think for many- And at some point, least, you like you had these like self-doubts along the way. Totally. Like yeah. All, you know, basically most of the way, I yep. had these like self-doubts about, you know, yeah, I'm not, is it just lucky? Is it just timing? Like, I'm not really an executive. All these people know better than me. I nearly gave up the CEO seat in, 20, in, in 2013 when we had a private equity firm come through, make an offer, and they asked me, hey, what do you want to do after we make the acquisition? And I, in my head, I was like, well, you're going to give me a bunch of money. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Uh -huh. And so that's basically what I said. I'll do whatever you want me to do. 
And they're like, great, well, like, let's go bring in a CEO. And they started like introducing me to other CEOs. And I was just basically resigned to the fact that I was not going to be CEO of the company anymore, but that there was going to be this great financial outcome. And that would have been, you know, I would have done myself such a disservice because I've had all of these incredible experiences running the company since then. And so I would have just told myself, like, there, and what happened? Out. Like, how did you, how did that not happen? Like, uh, the yeah. deal just broke apart. Oh, you know, okay. Like, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the deal just didn't happen. And then the next group of people who came through the next private equity firms, they didn't ask the question the same way. They didn't ask, like, what do you want to do? They asked, hey, you want to continue being CEO, right? Yeah, yeah. They were, like, they, yeah, in right. fact, they probably yes. wouldn't have invested if you said no, right? Because they, yes, they didn't want to go through the a, whole hassle of finding another CEO. Totally. Right? Yeah. And I didn't realize that either. You know, private equity firms don't want to buy a company and then go immediately do uh, a CEO search. They prefer yeah. to have a strong CEO in the seat. Um, so I would just tell myself, like, chill out. You're, you're good enough. You can, be, you can be great in the role. Okay, this, this is great. Thank you very much, Henry. Really appreciate it. Uh, where where else should people find you or follow you or et cetera? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn uh, where I contribute my business information. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on Twitter or you can email me. I'm just henry.shuck at zoominfo.com. Yeah, the great thing is your contact information is perfect on Zoom Info, I'm sure. Yeah, it is. You can text me if you have Zoom Info. You have my number. <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> thanks again. Great. Thank you, Oren. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, consider leaving a review. For more World of Das, and that's D-A-A-S, Das, you could subscribe right here on our YouTube channel, or you could find me on Twitter at Oren, A-U-R-E-N, Oren. I'd love to hear from you.